You're listening to Tongue Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim Muirhead and I will be your host for today. Today we are really lucky to be talking about the new Teika Watiti film, Jojo Rabbit. The film is set in Germany during the closing months of World War II and revolves around the life of a 10-year-old boy, Jojo, and how he sees the chaos happening around him. One of his coping mechanisms is an imaginary friend in the form of Hitler himself. Adolf? Hmm? I, I don't think I can do this. Was? Of course you can. Sure, you're a little bit scrawny and a bit unpopular, and you can't tie your shoelaces even though you're ten years old, but you're still the bestest, most loyal little Nazi I've ever met. Not to mention the fact you're really good looking. So you're gonna get out there and you're gonna have a great time, okay? Okay. That's the spirit, okay. Joining us today are the co-supervising sound editors. First up, let's say hello to Tobias Pape. Tobias is a multi-Golden Reel Award winner whose previous credits include a whole bunch of the Transformer series of films, including sound designer on the recent Bumblebee, as well as House with a Clock in Its Walls, Need for Speed. Tobias, welcome to the show. Hello, glad to be able to join. Excellent. Also joining us today is our returning champion, Ai Ling Lee. Ai Ling was previously on Tonebenders in episode 90 to talk about her work on First Man. She is a four-time Oscar nominee and has a whole slew of CAS and Golden Reel nominations as well. In addition to First Man, her past credits include La La Land, Battle of the Sexes, Deadpool, and Wild. Ai Ling, it's wonderful to have you back. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be back. So you guys have recently wrapped up the sound on both uh, Jojo Rabbit and Lucy in the Sky. How did you guys first start working together? Toby and I, we met when we worked on Transformers 3. Kind of feel like, you know, we had a good working relationship and taste and style. And uh, later on, when I was supervising other shows like Maze Runner, Death Cure and stuff, um, it just worked out. And I was fortunate enough to have Toby to be one of the sound designers to help on the film. And when I got the show for Jojo Rabbit, also, it happened to be uh, Lucy in the Sky. Both filmmakers uh, wanted to have me involved to do the sound design, supervising, and re-recording mixing. And the schedules were kind of like really much back-to-back. And I thought, you know, it would be great to um, have a co-supervisor like Toby um, with his style and skill set and how well we collaborate together um, to form a team together for these two shows. And so how do you split up the work? Because a lot of times when it's co-supervising sound editors, one is kind of more in charge of dialogue and one is more in charge of the sound effects and such. But Mm -hmm. it seems like both of you are sound designers. So how did you divide up the work? Since we have both worked together as sound designers before, so I feel like um, because with two movies so close to each other, it was good to have like brainstorm together um, because like with Jojo, so much of it happened in Germany and um, we all wanted to have an authentic sounding soundtrack for like down to backgrounds like, you know, it could be Walla, it could be insects, birds, uh, any kinds of like period sirens and whatnot that are authentic that we know, you know, is like, you know, based in Germany um, back in uh, late World War II period. And having Toby, he's from Germany, <laughs> over the years, I had done some recordings uh, from Germany or from, you know, worked there before. So um, that was a great palette of sounds that he could help contribute for Jojo Rabbit. Yeah, of course. And I mean, obviously, uh, because of the topic and everything on Jojo Rabbit, I was very interested to do that movie, you know, interested in the in the story. And um, just another thought of, uh, you know, Eileen and my uh, collaboration is that um, if you have two uh, uh, sound designers working on it, you can um, get a very effective uh, workflow where one does a first pass right and uh, uh then um the brainstorming happens even before or it can also you know after a first pass is done and then the other person with their experience just tweaks it takes it to the next level and then that is standing on its leg you know it doesn't go through like numerous iterations and with Eileen then being the uh, re-recording mixer even at the end gives you a very smooth and, and fast workflow and also very satisfying. So Toby, did you always do the first pass? No, no, it depends. I mean, I linked us the first pass on scenes and I'll do the first pass on scenes. 
it's really up to availability at that moment, you know? Yeah, like sometimes we may say, you know, some of these shows I may start first, so I would do, you know, some of the scenes that the filmmakers ask for, and then I'll have one pass of it. But sometimes I do like to have a fresh perspective of stuff. Then I may say, hey, Toby, you know, for the scene in Georgia Rabbit, when Hitler first appears, you know, there's like, you know, Taika wants like some oh, you know, I want some wish buys. And we'll go, okay, what kind of, you know, what were you kind of maybe thinking, you know, along the way? So, oh, maybe something tinkly. And then Toby would do a pass. And then I would also do a pass at it. So we have different alternates, different take on something just to see. And then Taka would hear them, listen to them, and that could trigger other ideas. Like he would go, hmm, I want something lower to add to it then like come up with different low wash or um, natural air blow by sounds and stuff together with the chime tinkly sounds and with the two of us together you know sometimes I do get it some supervisors may hire a bunch of sound designers to come up with alternates but I think in this case we are both fully responsible to create good alternatives and we can then shape and present and maybe like take the best of you know, certain parts up that are his and some parts that are good that are mine that were created and we'll make something together and it worked well for Taika. One thing that I always find interesting is when two people are working together when you both have maybe competing ideas for a moment in the film how do you go about uh, deciding which direction to go well i think the director decides that <laughs> <laughs> but you have to decide which you present to the director totally totally in this case um, it's a very good question <laughs> um the odd thing is i don't know we ha- if we have too many um competing opposing thoughts and ideas during these two movies what do you think toby <laughs> not not really i mean if you would put it more general, I think we're just able to, you know, hit a certain, you could call it quality or, uh, you know, do a certain delivery of a scene that, if I would say in percentages, hits like over 80, 90 percent of an agreement. And then it's really up to the collaboration with the director, which can happen in a spotting session or, as I think said, on the stage then. You just go that way, right? I'm just trying to think of a moment where I really felt that, you know, something is happening to what I've done and I don't like that at all, you know, because my ego gets in the way or something like that. I think we're we're a good team and um, we'll just uh, do what's best for the movie. Luckily, in the case of Jojo Rabbit, you have a filmmaker who is really good. <laughs> so, you know, he'll he'll tell you and he'll understand and then it makes more sense. I mean, there are definitely occasions where uh, idea gets thrown out in the room, which is 180 degrees of from what I was thinking. That gets a little bit more complicated then. I'm just always interested because I find particularly people who are kind of starting off in their career, when you work really hard on a scene, you think you've got it to where you like it. And then someone else comes in and says, oh, what about this? What about this? You have to give your ego a check a little bit to say, like, this isn't about me. This is about the film. And uh, I'm always interested to see people who are obviously very far along in their careers like you two, that that is how you do it, that you don't take it personally and that you work together and uh, it's all for the point of the film, I guess. You know, if you have a vision, an idea... And typically we like to work it out with the filmmaker as early as possible. But sometimes you do not know how things would change by the time you hit the stage. Things could play differently in a much bigger room with cleaned out dialogue, with live orchestrated score, whatnot. Things may play different and you may see, you may go, hey, the scene, you know what, maybe the scene is better if it is simpler and let the scene play or let the music play. Um, you know, take the lead, um, whatnot. It's uh, one of the things I've learned um, when I'm mixing is my own material is not to be attached to it and kind of think a little differently to have a slightly fresh perspective on it so that you're not like always stuck in one way of thinking. Like in Jojo Rabbit, when Hitler was in the kitchen with Jojo and that's the one point in the movie where he really became a lot like the real Hitler, the way he would give a propaganda speech and stuff. 
and take a thought to try and you know add like a like a delayed verb kind of almost like hearing it through a PA system in an arena kind of like you are there at, at, at one of Hitler's propaganda speeches we want to share at the moment um, but you know you try things and it, it turned out to be a great idea that we used in the film so you mentioned earlier the scene where uh, he's talking to his imaginary friend Hitler. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of dig into that because it's a, it's a fairly big part of the movie that this little boy has an imaginary friend who is Hitler. So what did you guys do sound-wise to sell the idea that Hitler is only there for the little boy? So to introduce it, to juxtapose the reality from you know, Jojo's imaginary Hitler friend, we wanted a feeling of childlike imagination especially for the first few times when we see him appear or disappear Taika also wanted to see if we can add some enhanced sounds like you know the first time when he appears we have like this you no know, subtle um magical low whoosh during the mix we are very careful about when we hear Hitler's movements, even his bowly or production movement. So if he's in the room with a bunch of other characters, we try to remove and not play any of his movements. When he is only with Jojo, then we would hear his movement as fully because he believes that Hitler is real. Again, this is also another example for this movie, as you said before, Less is More, where those moments when he disappears and appears, they are very subtle, but it works. It's not a magic sorcery type of sound. There's a moment in the film that is very subtle, and I'm not sure if it is even music or effects, but uh, near the beginning of the film, Jojo runs away from his uh, camp troop. Hitler appears to talk to him and gives him kind of a pep talk about how he shouldn't be ashamed to be called a rabbit. And he says, be the rabbit. And so quietly underneath, there's three little chimes on each word that he says that just make it like it's obviously the title of the film, Jojo Rabbit, but it also like gives it just this extra magic. And then Jojo embraces his rabbitness. And I thought that was a really effective moment. Oh, cool. Yeah. Be the rabbit. That was um, music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, were, you guys were doing the mix and yeah. supervising, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the music of the movie is, is great. You know, it goes along with that satire, magical, and yeah, childlike kind of thing. So it's, it's great. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about the weapons, because although this movie is supposed to take place at the end of World War II, so decades and decades ago, the sounds for the weapons are not kind of antique sounding weapons. Like you got some big boom in the explosions and uh, some nice whooshes and stuff like that. How did you decide to kind of tackle the weapons in a more modern way? Earlier on in the film, leading up to that invasion from the Allies, any kind of like battle sounds we were purposely um, not playing them up at all and trying to keep them more like distant and dangerous but not overwhelming because you know to these children to keep it to the POV you know they know there's a war but the reality hasn't quite set in for them and then by the time that the invasion actually happened when Yorkie drops the RPG and it just like shoots out Yorkie? God. Jojo! Oh, I've missed you. That's when we wanted to amp up the sounds of the war. It's kind of like a funny moment when Yogi drops it. So I think that's when we make the sounds a little bit less realistic and a little bit more overly exaggerated, a little bit more sounding more dangerous. Because during those moments, I think gradually it's going to hit to Jojo and his friends that the war is real. Also, because they are scared about that thing going off, right? It also goes along with the theme of the movie a little bit that children shouldn't do this, you know? Because f- until that point with the Hitler youth camp and, you know, brainwashing those uh, those children, for them, this is just a, a big game, right? When that thing goes off, it's like, they still don't realize that that can kill people, probably. But, I mean, they're a first time, like, scared of it. So that's also the reason why this moment is a little bit bigger. Another weapon sound in the movie. This is near the beginning of the movie. Maybe this is a minor spoiler, but uh, it happens 
10 minutes into the movie, so I don't think so if anyone hasn't seen it yet while they're listening to this. But there's a moment where Jojo throws a grenade and it bounces back off a tree and uh, explodes. If you think about this scene as separate from the movie, it's a scene of a small child being blown up by a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. And yet it's hilarious. (laughs) It's really quite funny. And I was just wondering if there's anything that you guys kind of used sound to add to the humor of it, because it's a scene that works really well, but must have been really hard to pull off. For us, for those hand grenades, very early on, Taika had mentioned like how much he wanted to make sure that it sounds like a World War II hand grenade. But then they said it's a practice grenade, uh, so it should be half power, not a full power hand grenade. So we started research and realized that they are much brighter and thinner sounding. Those grenades actually went through many versions. We tried more of like a thinner, sharper sound that is, I think, from wherever I could research to find how a World War II period hand grenade would sound like. Those were too like bright and sharp and, and too dangerous sounding. Then we started adding some of the production explosion, but it didn't sound right for the scene, make it not as dangerous uh, because they kept stressing that it's half-powered training grenade, otherwise Georgia would have been killed. (laughs) So I added like some dirt debris sounds and uh, some other uh, recordings of like a more distant um, low mid element for the explosion that kind of did the trick for them. Throughout it all, wasn't really to make it funny, but at that time when we were working on it was to make sure that it didn't sound too overly dangerous or overly big, something more distant. Did you have to do any recordings to get the sound of Germany from decades ago, or were you able to dig up these quieter towns? First of all, the production sound recorders recorded a lot of good material on set. So we got a lot of good wild sounds from them, especially also the vehicles, which, you know, we, we also put those in the background. So it's like spotted backgrounds, not just blanket stuff, which is also important for the movie. And then uh, he had some specific backgrounds from the locations. And then, of course, for me being German, I had definitely German sparrows and German forest ambience and some German town stuff for sure that I recorded myself or that I gathered over the years, you know, working over uh, in Germany in my 20s. As far as like the loop group for like the kids and stuff, um, we had the loop group uh, leader find kids who speaks English, whose parents are German. Their parents would be at the loop group session and, you know, we did um, loop group where, you know, the kids would speak in English, but with like German accent. Toby, what was your favorite sound moment in the film? Jojo Rabbit. <laughs> That's a good question. I think the grenade is pretty good. I like I like that one. Uh, hold on, there's more. Oh, there is a little uh, uh, collage sequence in the beginning of uh, the movie It's also working good, you know, as an arc. Uh, I mean, there's not too many like you know special effects designy sounds in there but if you just take the beginning of the movie you know starting out with uh, um, Hitler you know talking to Jojo and then we go into uh, basically Hitler is kind of like a pop icon for him right and it's all about you know their back and forth it's all about the dialogue and uh, then we transition into like a more like a collage sequence where he almost gets presented as a pop icon together with the Beatles song. So we have the the crowds playing, right? And then that ends uh, with speech, um, his Nuremberg rally and the sounds there are actually the recordings from back then, the Heil Hitler chants. So that's also, I think, good sound choices in there that establish that that movie very well in the beginning. Also, the crowd cheer and screams. We purposely look for more of like those higher like female concert kind of cheers instead, just to play along with the Beatles song. It's a really effective sequence because uh, the sound design in cooperation with the music. The music is a Beatles singing a German version of which is I want to hold your hand. Which I can't yeah, remember which. Song I think it is, I no. think it is. Yeah. So it kind of is uh, making an allegory between Beatlemania and. Hitler mania, I guess. Uh, so like how the pop cultural uh, phenomena that was the Beatles, it's making an allegory to that of how Germany was overwhelmed by the kind of cult of Hitler. And it's a really effective sequence that I really liked. And it's also is kind of paired with at the end of the film, 
uh, a German version of another pop song, which I guess we won't give away right now for anyone who hasn't seen the film. But there's a nice bookend there that is very effective uh, emotionally. <laughs> yeah, it's mm-hmm. really cool. Eileen, yeah. what, did you have a favorite sound moment in the film? A scene that I kind of liked was um, Elsa and Jojo. They were both staring out. Uh, into the night sky and that's when the allies were starting to invade into that town but from a distance to them you know the war is coming to them um, but the moment just felt so ironically like peaceful we have this like really distant low explosions and sirens and planes and guns and stuff going off but it just sets the mood I feel yeah, it must have been a tricky mix, too, because you have to have the the distant bombs and stuff loud enough to punch through, but the conversation that the two kids are having is, like, they're not talking loud. Yeah, it's very intimate scene. They're almost whispering it. Yeah. So you have this, like, contrast where you have these big events that's actually happening, and, and you see all the light shining on them, and so, you know, we had that some um, distant explodes there, but um, it's a very intimate um, scene. Um, so yeah, so I thought it was quite a good uh, contrast yeah, it, that worked, I think. Well, I think we can end it there on that note. Thank you very much for talking to us today. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Always fun. Dumbbenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 